Good afternoon. Uh, now we'll be starting the next session on water, land, and society. And the first speaker would be uh, Dr. Veena Srinivasan. Dr. Veena Srinivasan is a fellow at ATRI, where she works on social and development issues centered around water. Her current research includes sector, intersectoral water allocation, threats to freshwater from local and regional, global, regional to global scales, impacts of multiple stressors, including demographics, climate change, and urbanization on water resources, sustainable water management policies, and practices in socio-hydrologic systems. She leads uh, several interdisciplinary research projects that combine field hydrology, low-cost sensing, and citizen science, and simulation modeling to understand and find solutions to critical water problems. I welcome her on stage. Thank you, Manish. Um, I feel a little bit like my thunder has been stolen by uh, some of the messages you've already heard. So hopefully some, uh, we'll try and get some new messages in. Um, so by almost any measure, no matter how you measure water stress, uh, India is water stressed. And whether you measure water risk, uh, physical and economic water scarcity, uh, environmental water scarcity, human water security, pretty much any way you measure water, it, uh, water stress, India is water stressed. And that's pretty scary for all of us. Now, if you go back and you're a water researcher and you look at 25 years of articles in the high profile journals like Science and Nature, almost every six months, you come across an article which shows some new map of water stress, water scarcity, water pollution, water vulnerability, and India looks bad in every single one of them. But for people like us who work on the ground in India, I often look at these maps and wonder, so what do we do about it? We all understand that what is the problem, and we've got to do something about it, but what do we do? Now, it seems like the answer is pretty, uh, should be obvious. We have a large number of very high profile institutions all over the country with civil engineering departments, all producing research. So we should have the science to be able to answer these questions. But when you actually dig deeper, you find that we actually don't have either the high quality data or the science which can answer even basic questions. If I ask you what's the total amount of water that's being consumed for different crops, has somebody actually measured it? What's the amount of um, uh, water that's being used by plants and forests? How much water loss is used by uh, flood irrigation versus drip irrigation? And you look for really good empirical data on any one of these different measures that you need to be able to answer these big picture questions, you find that that kind of data simply doesn't exist. And the other problem is that a lot of the science that we do is actually, at least, in, and I'm speaking as a hydrologic scientist now, is really about uh, computational modeling and simulation modeling. And there's very little serious field research that's being done. Um, a lot of, uh, and I, this is a joke, but it's actually a reflection of the fact that I think we've actually lost, as a community, the field culture. And so I would, uh, and the other problem is that a lot of the policies themselves are what I would call fait accompli. Often, uh, as Professor Lal showed in his talk, the policy is decided first, and uh, in a very backward kind of move, uh, re researchers have been told what they're supposed to find from their research, and if simulation modeling is your tool, you basically build a model that shows what policies you're supposed to show, and it kind of ends up being uh, a circular system. So. I, uh, the pitch that I'd like to make for ATRI, and I speak now for the broader water program and broader work at ATRI, is I think ATRI's work in this area has, makes some serious contributions in some certain specific areas. And the first thing is what we try to do is problem-driven research. We try to ask science questions that really matter to stakeholders on the ground. Um, we try to work in interdisciplinary teams. The, the real world isn't neatly packaged as disciplines as it exists out there. And so if you ask prob uh, do problem-driven research, you have to work in a holistic, multidisciplinary fashion. And finally, we don't hesitate to use all kinds of methods. You'll see we use field-based methods, uh, instrumentation, lab-based methods, as well as computer simulation modeling. And hopefully, we achieve some insights which actually provide some answers. Now, though, I'm going to try to illustrate some of the findings and insights we've had through our research through a single case study on urbanizing watersheds. This was a large multidisciplinary project that just concluded, and a number of ATRI faculty were involved in it. And I'm actually going to work. Uh, this is the Arkavati watershed, which lies to the west of Bangalore. Uh, Bangalore City, you can see, is the red outline there. And it gets water from the Kaveri River, and the wastewater flows back to the downstream watersheds. 
Now, in today's talk, I'm actually only going to be talking about the upstream area or the TG Hulley catchment. And I'm going to tell you the three types of findings we found up, up front to help you kind of keep track of what uh, the messages are. And the first thing that we find is that we can see humans are changing the water cycle. And the traditional modeling approach of assuming a pristine watershed simply makes no sense. The second thing we find is that not only are some of the regulatory uh, incentive problems that Professor Lal mentioned, which is subsidies and electricity subsidies, a problem, but there's a fundamental problem in the regulatory structure. And that very clearly emerges from uh, our research reinforces that. And the f uh, last piece that we talk about is that the, uh, the mechanisms and systems we have in place to measure and monitor water is actually either incorrect or not useful. In f and if we can't measure what we need to measure, we can't regulate it. So the story of the, um, uh, this is the story of the TG Ali catchment. And the story here is that the flows into the TG Ali reservoir from Arkavati River have dried up dramatically over the last 30 years. And particularly since the late 70s, there's been a very, very sharp decline in inflows. Now, when we started this project, the first thing we did is let's think of every possible cause that could be drying the Arkavati River. Is it declining rainfall? Is it increasing temperature? Is it that we've fragmented streams due to urbanization and other watershed interventions? Is it that we've put so many eucalyptus plantations that they've increased evapotranspiration and they're sucking everything dry? Or is it that we are overpumping groundwater? And if you're a layperson not familiar with the water literature, you may not uh, completely realize that groundwater is in fact connected to sur surface water. So if you draw down the water table, it's going to suck your river dry as well. And our early analysis of just secondary data showed us very clearly that it wasn't climate that was causing this massive 90% decline in surface flows. So in fact, average rainfall, annual rainfall had not declined, and we did not see any significant change in rainfall intensity either. And it wasn't temperature either. Though, te though temperatures have increased, they couldn't explain the, the kinds of declines we were seeing. So uh, it had to be one, a combination or one of uh, the other three factors. And the question is, how do you tease uh, this very complex system uh, to be actually able to say which piece of it contributes how much and where? So what we did was we um, had spent three years collecting a lot of primary data. We installed soil moisture sensors, we, uh, weather stations, stream monitors. We ran borewell camera scans to understand the under nature of the underlying fractured rock aquifer. We did groundwater monitoring. We did a lot of secondary data analysis. And we did household uh, surveys and focus group discussions. So there was a lot of primary data uh, collected. And we found basically clear evidence that humans are completely altering the nature of the water cycle. Now let me explain what this means. So this is what the TGLE catchment looked like in 1972-73. Uh, the yellow is rain-fed uh, rain millet crop and usually ragi in this area. And you can see 1972-1973 it was all uh, ragi with you can see the red just in the command areas of the irrigation tank. Uh, this work was done by Sharad Lele and colleagues with the Ecoinformatics Lab. And, um, and uh, the irrigation, irrigated areas were confined to the tank command areas. And they were basically growing irrigated rice. Now, by 1993-94, uh, in the late 1970s, actually, borewell irrigation started becoming common. And by 1993-94, um, borewell irrigation had allowed the spread of irrigated paddy to areas much beyond the tank irrigation command areas. And you started to see a little bit of plantations coming up. But pretty much most of the activity was still along the stream channels and in the command areas. Now, I want you to keep track of that red because by 2001, 2002, the red has completely disappeared. So paddy completely disappeared. And our field research clearly showed that what happened in the 90s was that the shallow aquifer completely dried up. So there was no cheap, local, uh, cheap shallow groundwater available. And everything started moving to deeper and deeper uh, bore wells. So you could see that the, the rice declined and was began to be replaced by the green, the light green, is um, the irrigated plantations, and the purple is the unirrigated plantations or eucalyptus. So basically, uh, you started seeing a complete disappearance of the cereal crops, uh, the irrigated cereals, replaced by the more high-value vegetables, and then eucalyptus. And then finally, that trend was reinforced by uh, in 2013-14, when you really see eucalyptus and irrigated plantations taking over the catchment. And now Bangalore is beginning to spread into the catchment a bit. Now, what is the impact of all of this? The story that the Arkavati, the, the upper Arkavati story really tells us 
basically what happened was since the 1970s, bore wells emerged as an important technology. Farmers were able to break uh, the, the confines of uh, tank irrigation to be able to irrigate anywhere in the catchment. But because they were able to do that, they completely disseminated the shallow water table first. Then they began to go deeper and deeper. As uh, wells began to fail because groundwater began to decline, what they did was they started installing these check dams or walls along the stream channels. And what the check dams did was to basically take all of the stream flow and stuff it into the ground, which is why your surface water completely disappeared. And then because you had so much of borewell irrigation and eucalyptus, both of those um, activities began to take up any water that was infiltrating. And the net effect of it was both the sur surface and the groundwater completely disappeared. Uh, and it was basically being taken up by irrigated agriculture and eucalyptus. Now, the modeling effort, and I'm not going to explain the details of it, basically reinforces these basic messages. So uh, the streams dried up over time, recharge increased, and ET increased. And when we look at the groundwater balance, we find that the net negative of groundwater basically kept on uh, increasing over time, and groundwater levels uh, continuously declined over the entire period. Now, what does this say for national policy? The Arkauti is a single case study, and what does this tell us about what we need to be, how we need to be thinking about water at the national level? Now, clearly, uh, there, there are a lot of factors that Professor Lal mentioned in his talk, but I want to focus actually on a different one, which is the way we regulate water in India between ground and surface water. At the moment, there's a fundamental fatal flaw in the regulatory structure, which treats groundwater and surface water, and they are regulated and managed by completely different agencies. So central groundwater's worldview, uh, central groundwater board's worldview is sort of like this. Groundwater's a bucket, water goes in and water comes out, and we just need to worry about managing the bucket. While the Central Water Commission, which is tasked with managing sur surface water, uh, almost behaves like there's nothing which goes below the ground. Any rain that falls, uh, is evapotranspired transpired or flows over the ground into the stream, and that's all we need to worry about. But actually, this is a fundamental problem. As you saw in the figures I showed you before, water is constantly being exchanged between these two buckets. And the problem is that when governments put in place um, a, a mechanisms and incentives to recharge groundwater, what they are really doing is taking the water out of surface water and putting it into groundwater. And it's the same water that's being moved back and forth across buckets. Now, this is a very fundamental problem because in India, groundwater is not regulated. You're allowed to take out as much groundwater as you can possibly get, manage to get away with from under your ground, while surface water is regulated, which is a massive loophole because all it means is that uh, uh, individual farmers, if Every individual farmer stuck a bore well next to a river and pumped out, they could essentially take out the entire river. And so you can see there's a fundamental problem of double counting and mismatched incentives in the way we regulate water. Now, the second problem is that we are actually not doing a good job of measuring anything. Uh, and sometimes our scientific data are just flat wrong. So one of the problems that we found was that the monitoring well data in our of, uh, field areas consistently showed a water level barely 15 feet below the ground. But if we actually looked at farm survey data and we tracked how bore well depths were changing over time, you could see that wells are getting deeper and there are also more of them over time. And this is actually not reflected at all. So when we put the government monitoring well data next to the farm survey data, the monitoring well data show and this is depth below ground. It shows it's pretty flat over time. And the farmer monitoring data show a decline to almost 250 meters or 750 feet for the same period. So I want to go back to the three policy relevant findings. The first is that humans are changing the water cycle. The way we monitor uh, and model ground, um, ground and surface water is still as a pristine system. We pretend when we do, uh, do our dam estimates, we do uh, groundwater limits, uh, uh, estimates of how to set groundwater limits. We basically treat these watersheds like humans have nothing to do with them. But in fact, humans are dramatically changing these uh, systems. The second is that our regulatory structures don't reflect the reality on the ground. And this is not a new finding. People know this. But still, we've had a 50-year history of managing ground and surface water completely separately. And even today, if you go to presentations by groundwater board staff, you'll see that each agency is only trying to optimize their piece of the water. So they don't care if you're recharging groundwater by taking it out of surface water, as long as groundwater is being sustained, which is not 
a sensible way to think about it. And the th third piece of it is that our monitoring is drastically inadequate and sometimes just flat out wrong. And as researchers, but also as citizens engaged in the process, we need to constantly validate and check um, government data and be able to question and, and, and offer alternatives to, uh, to what's being measured, why it's being measured, and is what's being measured even sensible. Thank you.